Ladder joins us now. He's an emergency room doctor at Lenox Hill Hospital right here in New York City. CBS News senior national security analyst Fran Townsend and CBS News law enforcement analyst Paul Violas are also here. Good morning, Dr. Gladder. Thank you so much for having me. We had talked to Dr. David Agus later, earlier this morning. He was talking about the life and death decisions that have to be made when so many people are brought in with this kind of injury. Right. It's an ethical and moral dilemma uh, that all physicians, all health care providers go through because we try to save everyone. But unfortunately, that's not the case. The way this process goes is that the people who need immediate treatment, who have, for example, a collapsed lung, who can't breathe, they're treated first and they're tagged red. Others who are a little bit less severe that might be bleeding, they're a, a tier lower, and we call those yellow patients. At the scene, we have an elaborate system where it's basically mass casualty, where we tag these patients, we prioritize them, and we see who could be treated first. People, say a person with, say, a head injury who's barely breathing, we try to open their airway, but if there's not much chance of saving them, we have to move on. And this is what we all go through in trying to understand and really deal with this. Because you have seconds, doctor, That's to correct. make that decision. When you have 100 people on a scene, you've got to be quick. You've got to be rapid. You look at their pulse, their blood pressure. Are they breathing? Are they awake? You look at all these factors. And another hurdle for emergency room officials, we've heard, is that Good Samaritans did the right thing and by putting a lot of these patients and victims in their own cars and in taxis and driving them to the hospital. But given that, you don't necessarily have the statistics and, and the stats on, on what these patients are going through and whether or not they can be saved, correct? That's right. But we always appreciate patients that are brought in by, you know, by private people and, and cars because, you know, these are patients that get there quickly, sometimes faster than EMS. And these are, are, are situations where we can quickly intervene. One of the issues is that the security, I mean, who is this person bringing, you know, this individual in? We have to identify them. So at, at the gate, at, you know, at the triage, they have to identify themselves so we know exactly, you know, where they're coming from and what the situation is. At least so with first responders, they can give you some little nugget about what the condition is. Someone who's just bringing somebody in the car that just says help really doesn't know exactly what they're dealing with in most cases. Exactly. And, and one thing I do want to mention is that what we learned from Boston uh, is, you know, while this was a bombing is that there are certain maneuvers that help. And, and one is that using uh, certain tourniquets or properly applied tour tourniquets can be life-saving. Now, certainly individuals don't carry these. They may use belts. They may use, you know, other improvised devices, but tourniquets were something that could stem blood loss because blood loss is, the, is one of the key things, and ultimately that is the issue that kills people. And you put pressure on the wound right away. Correct. Is that what Direct you're pressure is always useful, but a tourniquet is much more much more effective. Um, and certainly, you know, uh, precautions, you know, so in terms of blood being at the scene, is a concern for any private individual, and, and has to be. A, a, a and that tourniquet can stay on for a lot longer, and you don't have to be holding it the entire time. That's right. A properly applied tourniquet, a wide tourniquet, a military tourniquet is the most effective. And that's what EMS carries. And these have been really life-saving, especially from what we learned in Boston. Carter mentioned this as well, but worth mentioning again, the, the, um, the request for blood donations in Las Vegas this morning. It's urgent. And, and I would you know, behoove everyone to try to get there, donate. It, it's blood is the, is, the, is the sustenance of life. We need it. And it's really life-saving. And what we've learned uh, from Representative Scalise and his interview with 60 Minutes and CBS was just the number of surgeries that right. these victims are going to possibly have to endure over the next weeks and even months because of, of the type of weapon used, correct? Right. These automatic weapons cause devastating internal injuries. We may see an entry wound and an exit wound. I may not even see the exit. but. It's internally that they wreak havoc. They destroy the intestines. They can puncture the lungs, cause fractures, cause bleeding in the pelvis. And this is the unknown area where we have to you know, do, use imaging tests and try to figure out exactly what's causing the bleeding. Many of these patients stay for you know, months in the hospital. Uh, infection's an issue. Um, we call hypothermia. These are all delayed consequences of, of such systemic trauma. That's what I learned. One of the things I learned on Norris Peace last night in 60 Minutes, the amount of blood loss, that there wasn't an exit wound, right. so that they knew immediately on the scene that this could be major trouble because of how the bullet moves inside the body and the importance of applying pressure immediately exactly. to the that you mentioned. Exactly. Most of us don't know even what to do or how to do that. Well, when you, you do what you can. Certainly belts are helpful. Um, you know, you try to constrict the air, you put direct pressure without putting yourself at any risk. But certainly, you know, when EMS arrives, the tourniquet could be life-saving. How, how equipped is a hospital? 
hospital to deal with that many patients coming in at the same time with a vast array of injuries. I think it's an important part you bring up. Um, they are. We, we drill for this. Uh, we're ready for this. But when it happens, are you, you know, ready for this? Well, we can be. You know, there's a coordinated effort between the emergency department leadership, surgical leadership, um, the hospital in terms of their leadership. You know, their organizational structure because we have to clear the ER. Mm -hmm. In other words, we have to make sure that any patients that are being worked up are moved to the floors or other areas to to make room for the incoming patients. Mm -hmm. And how do you coordinate with other hospitals? Well, there's different networks. We all talk to each other. There's called VHF, or very high frequency networks, that you can actually internally message, text, or email within that network, and we all communicate. And that goes to police, fire, and EMS as well. So there, you know, there are multiple layers and categories of, of types of um, communication that are really imperative to this effort. And time is of the F essence, and you have doctors on call, but uh, when you have something like this take place in the middle of the night, is it that more uh, pressing and difficult to get doctors in and wake them up? It is. It, it can be an issue, but I mean, there are always trauma surgeons in house, always ready to react, always to have an elaborate network go out of communication to all, you know, communicate and, and say that we're here. Bring us all together, nurses, doctors, you know, respiratory techs, everyone. It's, it's an entire effort, and it's it's a community. As a doctor, what did you think when you first heard this story? You know, when the story was first reported, it was two people dead. Then it jumped up to 20 people, and now it's jumped up to 50 and possibly higher. What did you think when you first heard the details that we've heard so far? I was horrified. I, you yeah. know, I, I always look at the initial reports, and I, I'm always suspicious because I know it grows. Knowing that the amount of firepower this man had and, and what it could do, I, I was very, you know, concerned that this could be a, a, an incredible, incredibly number more, more mm -hmm. <laughs> involved. The and death toll was absolutely. Go this was going to be something that was going to be a, a massive issue. And Dr. Glatter, you know, we heard ironically from a hospital official that they had just been briefed by somebody from Orlando's hospital that had treated the wounded from the Pulse nightclub shooting. Right. Uh, you mentioned the Boston bombing as well. How important is it for hospitals around the country to 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 learn from past experiences and have the sort of hands-on uh, expertise from those who unfortunately had to be there and oversee them. It's incredibly important, and it's what we do. We communicate with each other at conferences. You know, we present, we 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 demonstrate our methods, and these methods have to be practiced over and over again. You know, it's something we drill on in morning reports. We do emails. We communicate. We present about it, and this is how hospitals work. We work together, and we've learned from unfortunately these horrible incidences that we have to, you know have these protocols in place so we can save lives. Well, we are always so thankful for the first responders. Yes, very much so. And let's talk about the distance where he was shooting. They said at least 400 yards away, right. spraying into a, a large number of people. What does that tell you about the type of wounds or injuries that the hospitals are treating? Well, they're going to see a lot of wounds uh, caused by shrapnel, by blast effect, uh, not necessarily just direct hit. And so these could be burns, these could be secondary effects of the bullets themselves. So, you know, um, and there also could be injuries from people trying to just, you know, scatter in the event. Head injuries, fractures, falls. Uh, we don't know the age or the demographics of the population at the concert. Mm -hmm. And that's another factor because as you get older, your response from these traumatic injuries can be, you know, much, much less. And, and so. as, as law enforcement, Paul, and, and Frank,